My name is David Chenevere. My prison number is 95250. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I've been incarcerated since October the 6th, 1979. In a couple of weeks, I complete my 39th year and start my 40th year on the inside. It'll be my 40th Christmas. My dad is the one that arrested me. It was heartbreaking. I'm incarcerated for two counts of second degree murder, and I'm serving two natural life sentences that are running concurrent. So I have one life sentence. Good morning, Mr. Chenever. I'm Bonnie Jackson. Good morning. Your, your case has been assigned to me uh, for review. And my first response is, how did I get so lucky to get this case? Because your folder is over 700 pages of information. And obviously, we can't touch on everything. But I would like to talk to you about the things that uh, I think are most pertinent for this board's consideration. Sure. Uh, let, let's just start with some basic information. Uh, at the time of this offense, you were a first offender. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And you were how old when this crime was committed? I just turned 21. Okay. And how long have you been incarcerated? My father arrested me on October the 6th, 1979. I'm in my 43rd year on the inside. And today, how old are you? I'm 63 now. Uh, you know, Mr. Shinnevere, I'm going to be honest with you. This is a really, really hard case because the facts in this case are very hard and very difficult. I understand. And that. as you can see from the screen, there are a lot of people here. Uh, whose lives have been impacted by your actions. Yes, ma'am. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what was going on in 1979, how you came to uh, commit these crimes, and then we'll move forward to uh, looking at the last 43 years um, yes, of your incarceration. Uh, this case, uh, Garnered a lot of notoriety in East Baton Rouge Parish back in 1979. And, you know, to be honest, I still remember the case, even though it wasn't tried in this jurisdiction. Every time I drive by that apartment complex on Essen Lane, I'm reminded that there were two people found in a dumpster uh, at that apartment complex. So it was a crime that had a tremendous impact. Uh, on the community. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, how did you come to know the victims in this case? I met Michael Brown in 1975 when I began working at Louisiana Fire Extinguisher in Baton Rouge. We worked together for two years before he left that company. I moved into the same apartment complex that him and his wife, Judy, did. And we were good friends. After he left that company, we remained good friends. And Ms. McIntyre, Ms. McIntyre later moved into the residence with where Michael was living on North Stephendale. And I eventually wound up meeting her through him. In mid-1979, I began renting a room in the house from Michael on North Stephendale, and we were all friends living in the house together. That's how I knew him. Okay. And how old were you when you moved in with him? Were you 21, 21 at that time? 21, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that your father and your brother were both in law enforcement. Is that correct? Ma I've got several other family members there in East Baton Rouge Parish in law enforcement. That's correct. Mm -hmm. 
And you actually uh, were in scouting and you were an Eagle Scout. Yes, ma'am. So how does someone who grew up in a law enforcement family who went through the Boy Scout system and earned the, the, you know, the rank of Eagle Scout, how does that person um, become the person who's sitting here charged with two counts of, uh, or sentenced for two counts of murder? It was the 70s, Miss Jackson, and I was running fast. Started smoking marijuana, partying. I went a couple semesters at LSU and saw how fast life could be out on that university. I wound up withdrawing from school and got involved with drugs in a terrible way. And do you know what mostly, mostly, you mostly, mostly, in the, mostly, mostly distribution, distribution. I was living too fast and going in too big of an operation. Um, so how did this friendship end in murder? Ms. Jackson, like all drug deals, one eventually goes bad. Okay, let's talk about that. I, my, we don't my, know what was going on. We don't know what... I realized, I realized that. Mike and I had a big argument on September the 27th, 1979. And we were involved in something that was larger than both of us. We were moving a lot of marijuana through East Baton Rouge Parish. And I had a shotgun stuck in my side from my friend. It was just an argument, totally unexpected. There was no one there except Michael and Evelyn and myself. What was the and argument? I, what was the argument about the, Mr. The, the argument was about drug money. We'd had a lot of drugs fronted to us, and we in turn fronted it away. And there was no hurry to collect the money, and all of a sudden we had to have it back. And Michael allowed me to talk myself out of that situation that night. We were all, I do not want to put the point the finger at him or Miss McIntyre, but we were all ripped that night and I talked myself out of that situation. He allowed me to leave the house. Of course, I'm living in that house. I left for a couple hours, went and had a couple of drinks, returned to this, returned to this house as I'm living there. And I just lost it, Miss, Miss Jackson. I lost it. It's a very sad situation. It was a very, I made a wrong decision. I made a wrong decision. And so they were killed at the house on Stephendale. Yes, ma'am. And you transported their bodies? Yes, ma'am. In the mattress? Yes, ma'am. How'd you do that by yourself? The back of Mike's truck, loaded them in the truck, pickup truck. And how were they both killed? They were both stabbed to death. And why was Miss McIntyre killed? Miss Jackson, that's a very difficult question. And there is no good answer for that question. But I do have one for you, ma'am. Right. I was caught up in the moment. I was sleep deprived. I was loaded. I was on amphetamines and alcohol. And I stabbed Michael Brown to death in his sleep. I did not go in there with the intention to kill him or her. It just happened. She woke up in the middle of the scene and was screaming. It was over within 15 or 20 seconds. All right. Well. I, I think the record um, that we have you know, gives us a lot of details about what happened in this case. You were leaving uh, the state and your dad having to be the one who arrests 
arrested or took you into custody. Yes, ma'am. Correct. Yes, correct. I went on the run and called home, and he came, got me in South Texas, turned me in, arrested me in Chief of Police Johnny Johnson's office. Okay. And what was the ride back like? Ms. Jackson, at that time, I was lying to my father when I got here back to Baton Rouge. I lied to O.C. Brown and the grand jury, my parents and my family. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I had told my dad that that morning that I was not guilty, and of course, that's what he wanted to hear. And so I was fabricating a story to him all the way back, trying to create a motive in a story. You have a tremendous amount of victim opposition and there's nothing you can do about that, but I understand. Uh, how would you address their feelings and their concerns? To each of my victims, I would like to humbly say that I am so sorry for the decision that I made on September the 27th, 1979. It was a bad decision. I acted alone and I accept full responsibility for what happened. I do not want, I do not want to say anything negative for the victims or about the victims. We were all tied up in a rough situation. I am sorry for taking your loved ones from you. Paul Brown, I took your brother. Judy, I took your, your husband while you were pregnant. Alicia, I took the daddy you never knew. I took your little sister. And Erica, I took your mother. I know I've affected each of your lives terribly. And I'm just asking if there's some way that you can forgive me. Please search your heart and try to. I was wrong. Well, let's, let's, thank you. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, the t uh, your time in incarceration. Uh, you you've accomplished a lot, uh, Mr. Chenevere. Um You're a mentor in the electrical school, and you've done that since 2009. You've been involved in that since 2009. Tell us a little bit about that program and how you became involved in it. Prior to re-entry, I've been a Class A trustee for 30 years. I worked seven years in maintenance at Camp J. I worked in the electric shop for 17 years on the bucket truck in the high voltage area. Warden Kane selected me when they began re-entry here in 2010. He needed an electrical mentor and he told me I was gonna be it. Um, I supervise the electric school. I've run about 125 individuals through that school in the last 10 years, probably 80 re-entry mentees, 25 Phelps students and 25 or 30 Angola students have all completed and gotten certified according to the program that is put down here by the Louisiana Department of Corrections. And I see that in 2007, uh, you graduated from uh, the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I obtained my associate, my bachelor's degree from the seminary. It's one of the best programs that's operating here inside Angola. Warden Kane was instrumental in bringing the seminary here from New Orleans. I'm not the 
same young man that I was in 1979. I've grown up here. I've grown old here. You're an inmate minister? Yes, ma'am. I What's serve it. I serve as the pastor of the Point Lookout Committee here at Angola. And what's the Point Lookout Committee? It's the burial team at Angola. I have stood over the last 65 funerals that we have, that we have done here at Angola. Every one of them. We've lost some good men. Carrie Myers and Reginald Watts and Jimmy Robinson, Sidney DeLoach through your board and all have been members of our team. Seems like I'm the last one that's preaching the funerals here at Angola. I'm the only one that does it. It's a, been a big wake up call in my heart and in my life. I also serves inmate minister on Sunday mornings on Ward 1 and Ward 2, caring for the brothers in the lock room. It's not unusual to see me feeding a brother or pushing a wheelchair or assisting in any kind of way on the ward. Are you involved in hospice? Uh, no, ma'am, I'm not a hospice worker, but I do same things that I do not sit with dying patients, but I do hold church as well in the hospice chapel on Sunday mornings. And prior to the pandemic, um, I've really had to step up on the point lookout committee. I've put a lot of body bags in coffins a lot in the last several years. It's been crucial to my heart. It's been a big thing. I've learned a lot there from our team. What other community service work have you done either within the institution or outside? I have acted as a speaker for Warden Kane. He's had a lot of outside groups in here. Um, Reentry has had a lot of outside groups. I've acted as a speaker. My biggest community service is working with the Point Lookout Committee. Um, we have worked inside the hospital, on the wards. We work up and down the wall, pushing handicapped people to ASH 2 and ASH 1. Anywhere I'm needed, I have, I have done my best to apply myself. I'm a big volunteer in this prison and I'm proud of that fact. I'm proud of that fact. I'm not afraid to help anyone. I see that you previously applied for clemency first in 1991 and then again in 1995, but it's been over 25 years since your last application. You want to talk to us about um, why you've chosen not to apply prior to now? Actually, that's actually that's incorrect, Ms. Jackson. I, I was denied a hearing in 2012. Okay. I, I, I was denied not a hearing okay. in 2000, and that is not listed on my application okay. there in front of you. But I was denied in 1992 and 1995, I had two hearings in Baton Rouge, both of which I did not attend. They were, this was prior to the television and they were held without me, basically. I had opposition then and I did see, I did see the extent of it. Um, this, is not, this is an opening for me and I've tried to take advantage of it. You want to appear in front of this board with a decent conduct record and mine is decent. I show that your last write up was in 2015. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What was that for? I do not like to point the finger at someone else. They said I messed up the count on the main prison compound and it was a rainy day. All the lead mentors were at a meeting at the at the HVAC building, and there was a recount, and no one came to the HVAC building and recounted. 
the third time they came and recounted it's what they call names and numbers they called for mag two and i said right here they called the colonel dumars down there and he checked and the lieutenant that was in charge of making the recount didn't come down there and count so i took the write up i played guilty to messing up the count i didn't get locked up for it because the staff knew that there was an error on their part what what do you think has changed you the most during these 43 years of incarceration? Ms. Jackson? My lawyer, my father, Mr. Sam D'Amico was my attorney. Him and my father always told me, stay focused. The time will come. I've done the best I could to stay out of trouble. There's no fights in my jacket. That's unheard of in this amount of time. It ain't go. There's no drugs in my jacket. There's no violence in my jacket. And I've applied myself. I've had a job since 1984 in one way or another at, at Angola. I've been involved. I've gotten involved. I've done the best I could to stay focused, stay out of trouble, and continue my education, continue to help and serve inside this institution. And I have grown. Good things can come out of Angola. I want to be one of those things that leaves here. Tell us about your relationship with uh, Mr. Brown's son. I'm very proud of that. When I was in the seminary in 2006, Mickey Brown wrote me from the penitentiary. Mickey is his son? Yes, ma'am. By his first wife, Vicki Hatton. He wrote me from the penitentiary in in Missouri. He was incarcerated? Yes, ma'am. And he told me, I have a copy of the letter right here. He told me that he was incarcerated and he had found Christ in prison and he had forgiven me for killing his daddy. He was very instrumental in sharing that fact with his mother, Miss Vicki Hatton, who was supposed to speak later. And, and we carried on a writing relationship for several years. He was released from prison, returned home to Denham Springs, and Mickey was going to speak in my behalf at this hearing. His mother will tell you that in, in a few moments. Um, he befriended me. He befriended my wife, Sheila, as well. And it was a powerful thing. Unfortunately, he passed this last year. Um, yeah, I can't go into all of the programs and the clubs and the organizations that you've been involved in. It's really you know, too numerous to talk about or to right. list or the certificates or the certifications that you have. Um, What is the biggest lesson you've learned over the last 43 years? You don't kill anyone. I've learned that you do not kill anyone. I know today I overreacted. I know today I acted terribly wrong and I could have squashed this situation probably with an argument, probably with a, just a verbal confrontation. I have grown up inside the prison. I've seen too many prisoners in and out of here three or four times. I see our new generation that are coming to the prison. We have some tore up young men. The world has changed in 40 years since I've been here. And you're seeing that effect here inside this prison. I want the opportunity. I would ask for the opportunity to be able to show what the Department of Corrections can do with someone that applies themselves. 
Thank you, Mr. Shinnever. Could I hear from the warden uh, if there's anyone in the room with Mr. Shinnever? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. He does uh, speak. I'm looking at his record and uh, first noted in 92 that he got his uh, MNA as far as his trustee status and, and basically has maintained that. Um, the write-up in 50, um, he speaks accurately on that, and he was two days and then uh, replaced back into the uh, the reentry lead as well as uh, being in the electric shop. Uh, that's why he was also uh, taking classes for his uh, NOBTS class. He's been a mentor in the reentry since 14 as a lead mentor in the electric shop and as others have spoken uh, he has been in that electric shop for many many years and has provided a service to us to keep like I said keep the lights on uh, in uh, in times of natural disaster and our hurricanes and, and such things that we've dealt with um, he's helped train a lot of guys to to leave out of this penitentiary through re-entry to uh, gain and employment or have the ability to gain employment through his uh his mentorship uh with the uh electric shop all right thank you very much warden and miss renat said that's all i have thank you miss jackson i don't see any other um, questions by board members so i would like to ask our staff to please introduce those who've indicated they'd like to speak today uh, good morning honorable board uh, i know there are many speakers so i will keep my comments brief please don't mistake my brief comments as not uh, total support for David because I have so much to say about him. Uh, I, I would like to also point out there were multiple people who tried to join the call this morning, but there are only so many people who could speak. Uh, I know Rick Ledoux from Cowboys for Christ wanted to give a significant testimony on uh, David's behalf and the impact that he's had uh, in, in their organization's work. Uh, along with Barbara Mills, other individuals who wanted to speak. Um, <clears throat> I, I speak on behalf of David to say Parole Project offers our total and complete support of him. If he is to be released, our organization will provide services to assist him with his reentry, just as we've had over a couple hundred people uh, since our inception. We have a, a high degree of confidence in David. Uh, and, and we would look forward to supporting him. That being said, uh, I, I do have uh, a personal relationship with David. Um, he and I lived in the same dormitory in the, while I was at Angola. Uh, I, it, it pains me to say this, but he's the only person who uh, beat me in Scrabble more than I beat him. David and I would often spend uh, late evenings uh, together quiet time uh, playing each other, uh, and but I got to know him uh, very well. And I would like to say that although I cannot speak for who he was in 1979, I can tell you right now that David is a person of high character and integrity. Uh, in seeing him when he's not in front of this pardon board, when he is not in front of the administration of Angola, he continues to be a person of high character and integrity. Uh, and there are numerous young men that he mentored uh, uh, employable skills uh, as an electrician, uh, countless people over the last several years who, who uh, did not have life sentences that were at Angola a short time and, and now are in the communities, our communities working with the skills that he learned. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Rosemarie Chenevere, uh, mother. You can speak now. We'll be able to hear you. Good morning. My name is Rosemarie Chenevere. 
and I'm David Chenevere's mother. Uh, I'm a little nervous, so please excuse me. Um, David is my oldest son. He's been incarcerated 42 years. Um, I think he has done the best he could at Angola as far as rehabilitation. Um, he got married while he was in prison uh, to his wife, Sheila. She's been a big influence on him. Uh, she has been good to him and she is good for him. And I think if David was to come out of Angola, Sheila would be by his side and leading him on to get reacquainted with the outside world. Uh, David knows that if he comes out, I'm here as long as I can. I'm not in the best of health and I'm going to be 82. So I don't have that long left. But if he should come out, he knows I'll be here to help in any way I can. Uh, he, he knows there's a house here, though Sheila has one um, that he would probably go home to. Um, I also want to say to the families of the victims, there's not a day in my life that goes by that I don't think of them, of what happened. I've had to live with it for 42 years. And and I just want to know, I want them to know that I wish them the best. I hope they can go on with their lives. I wish them all well, from Erica to Alicia and, uh, and their parents that are still living. Uh, it's been hard for everyone. I hope nobody ever has to walk in my shoes, being the wife of a policeman and see your son go to prison. It's twice as hard, I promise you. I'm here if he needs me, and he knows that. Sheila knows that. And I just, that is about what I, mainly what I have to say. I'm praying every day for the victims' families. Uh, I'm hoping David will walk out of there before I shut my eyes permanently. And if it's not in God's will, well, his will be done. That's all I've got to say. And thank you for hearing me out. Next, we'll hear from Vicki Hatton, uh, first wife of the victim. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead and speak, please. Um, many years ago, I learned to forgive David. I support his release. He is welcome in my home. David is not a threat to anyone at all. My son, Mickey, died in peace and in forgiveness and his last dying wish was to see David free. They were friends, they spoke, they wrote to each other and as his mother, my, I beg you, to give my son his final wish and release David from the hell he put himself and his family in. As a mother, I know what it is like and how it feels to have a son incarcerated. And I do not wish that on anyone. I pray that the other victims, families, learn to forgive as God showed me what true forgiveness is. And Ms. Jackson, I just get this feeling that you're not going to grant David 
his release. And I pray that you find it in your heart to release him. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from the opposition side. Uh, we'll hear first from Tracy Barbero, first assistant DA with EPR. Good morning. Um, I, would, I did not live in East Baton Rouge Parish when this offense occurred. Uh, so reading the clemency investigation was an eye-opening experience for me. And uh, I hear Mr. Shannon say that his jacket does not contain any drugs or violence. And yes, it does not as far as disciplinary action, but the jacket screams drugs and violence uh, due to the nature of the offense. I don't understand why he, in his wildest dreams, would have even applied for clemency back in 1991 and 1995 when this crime occurred in 1979. Um, I, I can say I, I probably do understand why he's applying for it now based upon everything that I've read and some of the comments that I've heard this morning. Uh, Mr. Chenevere has indicated he's grown old at Angola. I, I disagree with that. I do not believe Mr. Chenevere is old. I think he still has a lot of life left in him and he is certainly doing some very wonderful things while incarcerated. And, you know, I said this last week in a hearing and I hate to be, you know, a, a broken record, but, you know, rehabilitation is definitely one of the things that needs to occur in prison. I just can't let go of the punitive nature that, uh, you know, prison is designed for. And you know, he, he, he keeps saying he overreacted. It, it, this was not an overreaction, overreaction. I mean, he brutally murdered these two people. Um, and, and then the, the steps that he took after to hide it. And, and uh, you know, I know the nature of crime, you do it and you try to get away with it. But, uh, you know, he, he was given a, a gift with his plea. Um, this is, this, these are two people that were killed. This is not a single life we're talking about. I don't think he should get a, a two for one deal in the amount of time that he serves. And I reviewed his accountability letter and he wrote, never would I have imagined how severely my actions would wound and affect so many people. He wrote this in January of 2020. How can you not imagine how this would impact people. I mean, this was an intelligent young man. Yes, he got involved in the, the dirty world of drugs, but how, how can you not imagine how this would impact people? Um, I, I, you have a lot of speakers here um, this morning. I just ask that you please deny his request for clemency. Uh, okay, next we're gonna hear from the victim's sister, Ms. Kathleen Wallace. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. You can speak now, please. My name is Kathleen Wallace. My sister was Evelyn McIntyre. Mr. David Chenever brutally and viciously murdered my little sister, along with Michael Brown. He stabbed them a total of over 30 times. It was clearly overkill. For him to say it was over in 15, 20 seconds, try stabbing somebody or two people that much. My sister died a very painful death. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time, according to Mr. Shenavir. At the time of the autopsy, she was found to have clumps large clumps of her own hair in her hand. That's how painful it was for her. That image is forever seared in my brain, no matter how many years go by. She didn't deserve this. Mr. Brown didn't deserve this. He took it upon himself to meet out two life sentences to them, two death sentences. He was fortunate enough to receive two life sentences. That's the major word, life. He was charged with two first degree murders. That carried the death sentence. 
but he was given a gift. I agree with Miss Barbera. He was given the gift, both him and his family, of life in prison. He was able throughout the years to be a, at least a small part of his family. He was able to talk to them. He was able to visit with them. He was able to be a trustee. He was able to get married. All of these things he took away from his victims. They weren't allowed to do these things. He says that he's a different man. He says he's grown up in prison and he has many accomplishments. I, I will give him that. But none of this was afforded to his victims. None of it. The only thing that his family, that my sister's family and Mr. Brown's family, the only thing we had to cling to over the years was at the time of sentencing, when he was agreed to two life sentences, not one, but two. At the time of sentencing, I was sitting in the DA's office and he told us, and I specifically asked this question, will he ever get out of prison? And he told us, no, he will spend the rest of his life in prison. He didn't say, oh, if he does well, he'll be getting out. If he rehabilitates himself, he'll be getting out. So I made a promise after that. I promised my niece, who was just an infant at the time of her mother's death, I promised her that she would never have to worry about confronting the man that murdered her mother. She would never have to run into him at the movies or the mall or whatever she was doing, just living her life. And that's a promise that I am asking this boy to help me keep because that's what she deserves. That's what Mr. Brown's children deserve. I'm once again putting my trust and pleading with this board to do what is right and what is just. Don't allow David Chenevere to take away my niece's freedom or that of Mr. Brown's children as he did the mother and their father. And to you, Mr. Chenevere, I'd like to speak to you now. You once wrote a letter asking me to come visit you so you could explain to me what happened that day. There is no explanation. You sit here today and you, you said, oh, I don't want to point fingers. I don't want to put any blame, but you found Excuse a way me, to Ms. do Wallace, it. Ms. Wallace, we need you to address the board and not Mr. Schoenberg, please. Mr. Schoenberg, please. Thank you. Mr. Schoenberg, please. Thank you. 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 And I want to say that Mr. Chenevert earned his sentence. He earned it. He deserves to be where he is today. And no matter what happens, Mr. Brown will always be dead. My little sister, who was only 19, will always be dead. And he will always be a murderer. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. Next, we'll hear from Alicia Vaughn, victim's daughter. Do I? Am I, I on? asking? No. Mm -hmm. Am I on? Yes, ma'am. You can speak now, please. Okay. Um, I'm here with my mom today, which was my dad's um, wife, Judy. Um, she's opposed. She, um, she, she hold on. I need a moment. <laughs> she um, is such a strong woman. She um, has taught me how to be strong and be able to sit here. She's also taught me how to forgive. I forgive the actions. I forgive how my life has turned out after. 
which hasn't all been good. I wasn't afforded opportunities that I think with a father in your life would have. I am grateful that he has found Christ. And that is why I can forgive you. Thank you. My dad died a sinner though. I know what y'all were into. I'm very aware. I believe you speak the truth of that. I don't think you were lying about the massiveness of what it was. Thank you. I have talked to my uncle Paul, which is his brother. Before he even knew, I reached out to David to find out what had happened. And I reached out because I didn't know he wasn't allowed to reach out to me. Um, I've spoken to his wife. She is a Christ follower also. I believe David has done a lot of good. And so has his wife. I recognize all of that goodness. I do believe in a man that can change. I'm just sorry my dad didn't have the chance to change. I know God, I think he has already made this decision of whether he is released or not. I think it's written in the books already. I, um, we've all prayed here several times over this house, over our families, over this situation, even over David and his family. I can't imagine being his mother because I have a five-year-old and I'd be pleading for his life too. When I logged on today, I asked if I could be undecided. And they said I had to choose. So a pose came flying out my mouth. And that's the human side of me just being, being scared because it was such a brutal crime. I used to walk around when I was 16, being afraid if I saw you, if you would attack me. I don't believe you would today. I believe I have the protection of Christ and God all over me. And I do with you too. I'm not scared anymore. I believe you were truly, truly sorry. I know my mom, my uncle, my grandmother who is deceased, which is Michael's mom, were in opposition. And I'm gonna say it because honestly, it's not my choice. And I've prayed for it for years is I am undecided. And it's the reasoning of why I'm undecided. Because God says forgive. And I forgive. Yeah. But he doesn't say, do you let them walk after you forgive? Do you let them enter back into society after you forgive? Do they really change? I'm sorry, Ms. Long. Can you go ahead and wrap up for us, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and like I said, if he was my son, I would be pleading just like his mother. I hope she finds peace. I hope Evelyn's family finds peace. 
I believe we have found peace in this situation. Amen. Um, and we are, or at least I am willing to accept whatever decision it is. Thank but I do you. want to state my mom is opposed. My uncle is opposed. And I know my grandmother was opposed. And there's a lot of other people opposed. But I'm going to state I'm undecided. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Damp, do you want to um, speak now or would you like David to make his statement before your presentation? Um, okay, we'll let David go first. All right, Mr. Chenevere, we'd like to hear your statement. And address your remarks to the board, not those who are participating, okay? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Renata, I would like to thank you and the board members for being here today, for hearing me out today, for giving me this opportunity. I would humbly like to thank the victims for their participation. Again, I would like to humbly apologize to the Brown family, the McIntyre family, my wife and my family for the harm and the damage that I did in 1979. I made a bad decision. I'm thankful that Ms. Brown, that Alicia, I'm thankful that Alicia recognized what we were involved in. It does not take a life sentence to teach some men a lesson. Some of us grow up faster. Some of us learn faster. I've learned a long time ago. You don't kill anyone. I'm not a threat. There's no monster inside of me waiting to get out. I'm not psychologically deranged. I'm a safe individual. I still have something to offer to the world. And I'm asking this board to, I'm begging this board for an opportunity to be with my wife for the rest of my life. Thank you so much. God bless each of you. Thank you, Mr. Shinnevere. Mr. Damp. Yes. When uh, David was arrested in 1979, I was a young attorney. I'd been out a couple of years. I practiced with Sam D'Amico. Uh, I think Judge Jackson and, and Judge Marabella uh, know him. Uh, he passed away a number of years ago. So when I joined the firm at, after two years, I was the person that had to do all the stuff that nobody else wanted to do. And so I did the investigation. I met with David. I did, you know, I went and followed all the evidence. I'd go pick up the files. I would do those sorts of things. And by the time the case came up in, in, in our agreement, uh, I was probably a partner by then after, after four years. I have never in 40, let's see, 44 years of practice, I've never had a client like David. And I'll tell you the, the problem or the problem for me at the time, I didn't understand it. I did not understand how a person whose daddy was a high ranking uh, police officer, whose brother was a police officer, his family had, had law enforcement, in, Eagle Scout, good job. But again, I grew up naive. I did not, I'd seen marijuana uh, in college. I'd seen it in law school, but I'd never seen or heard of Black Molly's speed, all of these things that were going on in the drug world. Since then, I've had no, numerous cases where people have been on all of these sorts of drugs and done all kinds of horrendous things they would not have done but for that. But there is, there is no excuse for what he did. But this is what interests me and why I volunteered to do this. I, I met with uh, Warden Kane maybe a couple of years ago, 
on, on a different matter. And I was asking him about some of the people. I only had a few that I think were still in Angola. And I asked him specifically about David Chinevere. And out of the blue, he told me how much he liked him, how he thought he deserved a pardon, and how he may hire him to come help him. And so I went through the book, and I think y'all saw the book. It's, it's hundreds of pages of things that, that David has done. And, and, you know, one of the most important things is if you're a drug addict or you're on drugs 44 years ago, you're still a drug addict. If you're an alcoholic 44 years ago, you're still an you're still an alcoholic. It doesn't go away. But David went through all of the drug abuse courses. He has been um, on top of that. Uh, he, he has uh, been a, a mentor for others. He's done all of these things that, that you could humanly possibly do. And I think the fact that he's been through this this uh, these courses, the vocational mentor, which my understanding is extremely important. The fact that he got his Bachelor of Arts in Christian ministry. Uh, I've seen the articles and the tapes on him holding these funerals. I've seen the Cowboys for Christ stuff that he's done and all of the letters, at least to me, all of the letters from the people that he mentored are in the book. More have come in since then. He has the support of the form, former chairman of the board of paroles who wrote a letter and, you know, the victim's family. There are two other things that I want to point out. David has had some serious medical conditions. He had a large portion of his intestines removed in surgery in New Orleans. And so he has suffered with that for a long time. He's not a physical threat to anybody. And and lastly, I think the thing that, that got me the most, there was a letter fr from an a inmate who's paralyzed. And it's in the book. And he, he talked about how he's bedridden and that every Sunday morning, David comes to that ward, sits him up, gets him a cup of coffee, and prays with him. I got to tell you, that got to me. So of all the clients I've ever had and and Judge Marabella knows he and I've had some, some doozies. This is the most different person that I've ever dealt with. And it's the only time I've ever shown up before the pardon board asking someone for a pardon. So I hope you will consider this. And I think that if he gets out, he will have a normal, good life. He's got a wife, he's got a family that loves him and a bunch of great job opportunities. Thank y'all for letting me address you. Thank you, Mr. Damp. Um, I think that concludes all of the, uh, the interview process and the hearing from uh, the public. So I think we are prepared to vote. Um, we'll start with Ms. Jackson. All right, <clears throat> let me say um, first to Alicia. I understand what it means to be undecided. This is a hard case. It, it truly is a hard case because the crime itself was, was horrible. And I don't think Mr. Shinnever denies that. I don't think anyone in this process denies that. But my role here today is to, to not dwell on 1979 because if that is all we ever did, then no one would ever, ever have an opportunity for release. Uh, and I just want to commend uh, all of the speakers uh, for your graciousness. And I can feel the presence of God's grace resting on each one of you. But grace is unmerited favor. So there's nothing Mr. Shinnevere can do to earn grace. But what he can do is demonstrate his appreciation for grace by serving. And he has served faithfully for 43 years. I can't imagine what it's like to preside over the funerals of men who never had the hope of anything beyond the prison walls. 
can't imagine what it's like to comfort uh, people who uh, have no hope. And he has done that. Um, our role is to assess person as he is today, not as he was. Because if we did that, Saul would never be Paul and Peter would never be the apostle. And so we have to look at what God is able to do in the life of every human being. And I think that there has been a genuine transformation in Mr. Shinnier. I think he uh, has been rehabilitated. I think his remorse is genuine. And I think his opportunity to serve is still before him. And so my vote today would be to recommend a commutation uh, to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Wise. At this time, I uh, I have seen some of the work that's been done for Mr. Chevy. I've looked at all the certificates. I've been on this board over 16, 17 years. And I see stuff come in all the time, what people does. Usually they get their diplomas about a year or two before the hearing, and then they get ready for the hearing. This has been and something that's ongoing, some of the programs that he's taken. And our job is to see what he does and uh, through this whole past in his career. Today, my vote is going to be to grant 99 the immediate pro eligibility. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Mr. Marabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. First off, I would like to say to uh, Ms. Vaughn and Ms. Wallace, uh, I hear your pain and I hear your grief. And I understand, uh, I can't say I understand. I've lost people, but never under these kinds of circumstances. So I just wanna thank you for the courage to be here today and to tell us uh, what you feel. And Ms. Vaughn, I have never heard a young person or an old person speak as eloquently and compassionately as you spoke today. So I would like to thank you personally. As a former judge who has sentenced a lot of people, I know when we sentence people, we hope that they get something out of prison and not just go to prison to become better prisoners. Uh, as Judge Jackson has eloquently done. And, and Bonnie, I would like to thank you for such an excellent interview because it, it gave me a lot of insight as to uh, what this process is about and what this case is about. But as a former judge, uh, we hope that people can rehabilitate. And I understand Ms. Barbera's position that penal is part of the system as well. But as I look at what Mr. Chenevere has accomplished in my almost two years on this board, I haven't seen anyone who's accomplished as many things as he's accomplished. Uh, and also in listening to him, I do believe he's sincere and I do understand where he's coming from. And as painful as this vote may be for everyone, I believe he's earned the opportunity for a commutation. So my vote likewise is to commute to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. And, uh, you know, this has been difficult. I, I echo everything that everybody's already said. My colleagues, uh, I too am familiar with the work of Mr. Chenever uh, at Angola. I was impressed with uh, his honesty today and his apparent sincerity. And I, I was moved by everything everybody else said. It's been, uh, uh, this has been a difficult case, but I, based on the work that he's done uh, in preparing for an opportunity, and as Mr. Wise pointed out, this started long ago. My vote today also would be to recommend a commutation of sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Mr. Roche. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Shenevere, in my six years sitting on the Port Board, I have not witnessed an interview where an offender was as honest and forthcoming as you. And I want to commend you not only for a outstanding interview for the, and for the accomplishments that you've achieved over the last 42 plus years. But this process is not all about you. This process involves every victim that you affected by those two murders. Your family, the victim's family, and the community at large. And stating our mission as a pardon board, it says that we should keep the victim as a part of this process, as well as the offender. You have achieved a tremendous amount in the last one or two years. But as a victim's advocate, I listened to the sister of the victim. I listened to the outstanding presentation and the wisdom and the compassion of Ms. Vaughn's voice. I have not witnessed such testimony but a few times in my six years of serving. But as a victim advocate, I have to recognize that the vast majority of the victims are opposed. The entire legal community is opposed to your early release. So my vote is to keep the victim as a major part of this process based upon overwhelming express opposition from the victim's family and the legal community, my vote is to deny your request. And I do think you understand from the direction in which I am coming. Yes, sir, absolutely. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roche. So Mr. Chenevere, you've received Mr. Roche's unfavorable vote, but you've received four favorable votes. So we will make the recommendation to Governor Edwards on your behalf that your sentence be commuted to 99 years and that you be immediately parole eligible. Good luck to you, sir. Thank Thanks you, everyone for participating Thank today. How do we unpack this? To start, I'll let you know that we're gonna go after this and watch the parole hearing. They recommended it to the governor. This, this hearing took place in October 29, 2020. The governor accepted the commutation recommendation and there's a hearing on 12-13-2021. And it's not a short hearing, it's over an hour long. So we're gonna be here quite a while. I haven't seen it yet, um, but I've seen the research on it. And thank you, Richard, for putting this all together. It, this was a different kind of hearing. It was, um, it was intense. Uh, you know, there's one thing that I didn't record for you guys because it was just so unusual. But before the hearing started, before Miss Jackson, right before Miss Jackson came in to start the interview, a warden got on. You didn't see his face, but you heard his voice. And for some reason, they didn't interrupt him. And he went on for like three minutes singing the praises 
of David. And then when he was done, they let him the warden go and Miss Jackson started. And I don't think you guys need to hear it, but it was, you know, he was just singing his praises. Uh You know, it was, it seemed like he really had done and said all the right things. The emotions did seem real to me, but also a little bit almost too real or almost too like Hollywood and orchestrated. And I know that's not fair to say that because that's like, Otherwise, they're always in a lose lose. How would they? How would either it's not real enough, or it's too real, or it's fake, or it's but things that did stick out certainly is that he like he addressed the victim, he knew their names, he knew their relationships. Like, he, he, it's hard to fake that, right? Like, unless you're so so calculative in your manipulation it seemed like he actually did care. I mean, he wasn't, it didn't seem even, that part seemed very real to me. And he never used the words, I wish it didn't happen. I'm sorry that it happened. You know, it was, he did take accountability, but where he, where I thought he felt very f flat and Miss Barbera, my favorite DA, called it out and she's so she's just always so on point i mean the way that she articulated this scenario sums up i think my feelings about the case and it was you know when miss jackson said how did it happen you were friends with him he said well all all drug deals eventually like all drug deals everyone uh eventually one goes bad and so now he's playing on like a, you know the drug and then he says and you know and then he go i mean he goes on to say that that he had a shotgun at his side but then he talked himself out of it he went to a bar he came back and he stabbed, started stabbing him in his sleep, and sh she woke up, and he stabbed her, and the whole thing lasted 15 seconds. And like Miss Barbara said, it didn't last 15 seconds. I, th th this was, this was a rage. This was a complete butchery. And you add the, the drama of it. The policeman's son booked. The son of the city police lieutenant surrendered Saturday and was booked on murder charges in the slaying of two people whose bodies were stuffed in garbage bins. He was 21. He was an Eagle Scout. He was, it, it's just crazy how this happened. On the first degree murder charges were 26 and she was only 18. Police said that authorities um, said that the father called headquarters Saturday morning and said his son wanted to turn himself in. The young man was booked a short time um was booked a short time later police said the bodies were found tuesday night in a dumpster uh and here it is brown had been stabbed 20 times and the 18 year old is eight, the, the, she was stabbed 13 times that that's not it's over in 15 seconds that is, is brutal and like they described her hair was in her hand she pulled her own hair out that's how much pain and fear she was in he and like he, like one of the the victims said 33 stab wounds you, you so like the way that he just undownplayed it was not you know they issued a warrant arrest three days after the bodies were discovered investigators believe that the two were killed several days before and the bodies were dumped in a trash bin and I don't know if they, you know, th there's the other article here where they say the roommate was sought, but I don't know if he ended up, um, if there was ever a conviction on this, because even in this hearing, he said that all he did was use his roommate's truck. I don't have any information on that. 
but a warrant was issued for the roommate of the man whose body was found with that of a woman's in the apartment complex trash bin. Uh, 21 was charged with the warrant with the murder of 26. Sheriff deputies on Thursday, an all points bulletin was issued um, and was possibly headed for South Texas. Investigators of the district attorney's office said that they hadn't established a motive. Oh, wait, this is uh, Brown Carpenter and Miss a Barmaid died in numerous stab wounds. Both lived in Baton Rouge area, but not at the complex where their bodies were found Tuesday night. Sheriff investigators said they believed the victims were killed in the residence. This was the first newspaper. Sorry. This was the first article before he turned himself in. So I, re I read them out of order. Um, Richard put them in order. I just... I did not save them in order. So my apologies. And again, thank you, Richard. So there are more articles that we're going to go through. But before we do that, uh, let's jump into the parole hearing. And um, and then we can, we can unpack it more. But I guess a few things I want to get off my chest before we do that is... Um, the young lady who spoke, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name. Yeah, I thought she did speak quite elegantly. And I was annoyed that she was cut off by the moderator person. Um, I mean, it's like, read a room. Come on. You know, uh, so much of this hearing was, was not going to normal practice. Like the warden coming on before they all spoke. Um, he... David was addressing the victims directly, but then the moderator wouldn't let the victims address him. It was it was a very it was a different kind of hearing. A lot of religious talk, um, which we've seen before. And and I, I I I in this case I I don't have any objection to it. It seemed like everyone in the room was on the same page, and if everyone in the room is on the same page about uh, the same religious kind of beliefs, then. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, the, where, where I kind of find the offense is when, um, when you might have a victim that doesn't feel that way and you have the, you have uh, the, someone who's pro the victim who is, who is talking about forgiveness and all those things. Although in this case, and I, now I know I'm rambling a bit, in this case, I, 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 I am always, I do always find the fence when someone says, I hope the vic they can find way to forgive. And I hope, and it's like, that's not to you to ask from the victim in this room at this time. That's not fair to ask the victim for that. But, okay. That's my little piece. Um, let's go jump in. Committee on Parole is uh, called to order. Today is Monday, August 8th, 2 times 8.36 a.m. Uh, my name is Cheryl Renata. I'll be serving as chairman of today's parole panel. My colleagues on the panel this morning, seated to my left, is Mrs. Bonnie Jackson, seated to my right, is Mrs. Pearl Wise. We are seated at DOC headquarters in Baton Rouge. Um, first, I'd like to say a few to introduce yourself for the record. <laughs> John Smith. All right. And um, our remote location, our first remote location this morning is at Louisiana State Penitentiary. So, with staff at Angola, please introduce yourself for the record. Deputy Warden Rochelle Ambo. Rochelle Lagmaru, classification. Jody Sturgeon, transition specialist. Marvin Shipley, offender records. Marlene the Green classification. With everybody? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so our first case this morning is Mr. David Chenevere. Uh Mr. Chenevere, would you introduce yourself to the parole panel? Tell us your name and your DOC number. My name is David Chenevere. My number is 95250. And you are uh, here, you have counsel with you today, Mr. Damp? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm present. Go ahead, sir, introduce yes. yourself. Okay, I'm Jack Damp. Uh, I've been an attorney for uh, 45 years. I'm also here with uh, David's wife, uh, Sheila Schoenebeer. Okay, thank you. And um, we also have, uh, I think, joining us, I don't, I don't see her, is uh, 
Nikki Hatton with us this morning? She is, but she's just doing the phone call. She's not doing video. Okay, so, uh, and then okay. here with us, well, we also have in, uh, the district attorney's office from East Baton Rouge who will be speaking. We also have uh, Ms. Kathy Wallace, uh, Ms. McIntyre's sister who will be speaking. She's joining us by Zoom. We have some folks here in the room with us in Baton Rouge. Also representing Ms. McIntyre, we have Richard Boudreaux and Joan Guy, and at the appropriate time, we'll ask them for their remarks. We also have with us here uh, representatives for Mr. Michael Brown. We have Alicia Vaughn, Judith Poche, and Dana Altazan, all of whom are speaking. We'll call them in at the appropriate time. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, we welcome our media uh, folks who are here with us today. So, Mr. Shinnebear, you're here before the parole board this morning. You, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you appeared before the pardon board in 20, uh, December of 2021. And at that time, the pardon board uh, gave you a favorable recommendation to Governor Edwards that your sentence be commuted from life to 99 years with the recommendation for immediate parole eligibility. That recommendation was approved. Your sentence was commuted in May of 2022. So that's why we're here today. Um, you are currently serving a 99-year sentence for two counts of second-degree murder out of East Baton Rouge Parish. You have a parole eligibility date, which is May 6, 2022. You have a good time release date, which is uh, March 27, 2029, with a full term date, September 27, 2078. Mr. Schindler, is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Your case this morning has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. She'll take the lead on the on the interview, uh, and then we'll hear from all the folks that have indicated they'd like to speak this morning. And then we'll also, uh, at the very end, turn it over to your attorney for his presentation and close out for us. Yes, ma'am. Thank okay. you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Mrs. Schindler. Again, my name is Bonnie Jackson. Good morning. Uh, my case, your case has been assigned to me, so I will lead the question. Uh, as Chairman Renatz uh, pointed out, you did appear before the pardon board in December of 2021. I was a member of the board on that date, and uh, the board voted to recommend the governor's communication, which has been signed. Uh, so I want to just uh, go over a few things with you because many things were covered during the clemency uh, review process. How old are you today, Mr. Schindler? I'm 64. And how long have you been incarcerated? I've been incarcerated since October the 6th, 1970. Years. Ma'am? Years. 42 years and about 10 months. 42, plus to 43 years, is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. Having uh, been on the pardon board when your case was first uh, presented in December, uh, I know some things. Uh, I know the, the what of this case. I know the how of this case. But I will tell you what I'm left with with is the why. The why has never been entirely clear to me. Uh, at the time of this offense, how old were you? I just turned 21. You, according to your background, you've been an Eagle Scout. You made Eagle Scout at age 15. Yes, ma'am. Graduated from high school at age 16. Yes, ma'am. You enrolled in LSU uh, as a freshman at age 17. That's correct. Uh, your father was a police officer. Yes, ma'am. Your brother, likewise, was a police officer. Is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. So, as far as help, I understand how it is that someone with the things that I've just pointed out, your credentials, the things you've accomplished, how is it that you ended up 
leaving school and ending up in a lifestyle that brought about the incident that you were incarcerated for. So first, why did you leave LSU? Well, I left LSU because the lifestyle was a little slow. And though it was fast. Okay, what does that mean, Mr. Shigley? I don't understand. I lost, I lost interest in school. That means I lost interest in school. I was more interested in getting a job and staying out, running with my friends. It just I just realized that college wasn't for me. I was living, still living at home and traveling to the university from across town. I just lost interest. I was running with a different group of friends and that didn't help matters at all. And so you left LSU at age 17? Yes, ma'am. And uh, what was your next step after leaving? I began work at a place called Louisiana Fire Extinguisher in late 1975, and that's where I met Michael Brown. He became my close friend, and I worked with him there side by side for about two and a half years until after he left that company. And after he left, I still remained his friend. Um, Let's go back. Obviously, at some point, you started using drugs. I, I can't hear the audio. Okay. I said, obviously, at some point, yes, you began using drugs. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Smoking marijuana. Okay. Drinking. Yes, ma'am. When did that start? Probably about 1975, 1976. How old were you? 17. Um, marijuana was the only drug you used? No, ma'am. Um, what other drugs were you I using? took some, nothing serious. Some speed, How? some speed and alcohol. I'm not a junkie. I never experienced nothing like heroin or cocaine or meth or nothing like that. I smoke marijuana. But you and Mr. Brown began um, drug dealing. That That's correct? correct. That's correct. That start. 1976. Okay. And then you left LSU He was, he was getting relatively large amounts of drugs and I was helping him distribute it. What kind of drug? Marijuana, nothing what more. Is, well, uh, when the police went to the house where the murders occurred, they found 600 pills? Yes, ma'am, they were caffeine <clears throat> pills and they belonged to Michael Brown. That was in the newspaper. Um, they were caffeine pills. I didn't even, I didn't even know where they were. They weren't mine. And so that was found. That was found when I was in jail. Basically, you said that you all were dealing with marijuana. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And how long did that go on before this crime occurred? Through 1979. Now, what, what was not clear to me during the pardon uh, process, why did you end up, we'll start with Mr. Brown first, and then we'll talk about yes, Mr. Brown. What led to your taking Mr. Brown's life? Ms. Jackson, we had a verbal confrontation about over drug money. You have to realize you you have to realize elaborate a little bit. Okay, fine. In mid-1979, 
I moved into the house on North Stephendale with Michael Brown. He had another woman named Miss Lynn Fontaine living in the house with him at the time. And we were dealing drugs together. And we were being fronted a lot of marijuana and we weren't being asked, we weren't being told to pay for it at the time. There was no hurry for the payment. And so together we distributed a lot of stuff, fronted it out, if you will. And the night came where, totally unexpected, the night came where we needed the money back. And it was distributed in several parishes around East Baton Rouge Parish. And it couldn't just happen overnight. Michael and I had a large verbal argument. All three of us were ripped out of our mind. All three of you, all three of you, who you're referring to? Michael Brown, Miss McIntyre, and myself. Oh, you were ripped out of your mind from what? Alcohol. And marijuana, that was, and we had some pills in us. Some of these caffeine pills that we were under the impression was black mollies. Um, we were out of our mind, all of us. And I, I mean, I mean, no disrespect to the victims, but if you and Mr. Brown were in the same boat, if you will, both of you being, I guess, on the hook. For the money, how did that turn into a dispute between you and Mr. Brown that led to Mr. Brown's life? He, he was my he was my friend. I'm living in the house with him, Miss Jackson, and we had never had an argument before. This was totally out of character for Mike. He blew up at me, and I told you in December. He pointed a shotgun at me and he allowed me to talk myself out of that situation. He allowed me to leave that house and I didn't make that big of a deal of it. He was my friend. I live in the house with him and I left for a couple hours and I came back. I came back in the house and him and Evelyn are asleep in the bed. I went in the bedroom and stabbed them both to death. I was scared. I had been scared. I've never had a gun pulled on me. Let's stop right there. Uh, what was your relationship with your parent at that time? Ms. Jackson, it was excellent. And my relationship. Why didn't you go? I, I, I had my. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Shamir. After the incident with the gun being pulled on you and you leaving, why didn't you just go home to your family? Never crossed my mind. That never crossed my mind. I was scared to death. I was scared to death. They, for me to explain to, to for me to explain to them that I'm involved in drug dealing, would not have been acceptable. Well, okay, I understand that. We're going to get a house and family and spend the night wouldn't necessarily involve my family lived my family lived in West Baton Rouge Parish. It was probably a 25 minute ride to my family's home from far east. I was almost in Livingston Parish and uh it never crossed my mind, ma'am. So you acknowledge that both victims were attacked while they were in bed asleep, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma One of the things I wondered is how you were able to stab two people to death. You asked me you asked me that last you asked me that last December, Ms. Jackson, and I told you that. I got caught up in the moment. It was not a It was not a moment that I had planned. It was not a moment that I, as far as Evelyn, she woke up and screamed. I had no idea that that was gonna happen. That I was, I was out of my mind. 
I didn't realize I was that was going to happen. I didn't. I did not realize she was going to be killed until she sat up and screamed. All right, uh, Ms. Chandler, uh, I appreciate you discussing that with us. I think that's important uh, have uh, before us today. Um, we're here today basically to determine at what point you should be released. Because of the commutation, uh, your release date, whether this board does anything at all today, will be March 27th of 2029. And so okay. you're, going to, you're going to be released regardless, unless you do something that would you know, throw a rent into that, which I think is highly unlikely uh, given uh, your conduct while you're incarcerated. But in any event, on March 27, 2029, you will be ruled. Yes, ma'am. Now, uh, back in December when we had the hearing, we talked a lot about some of the things that you have done. And I've only been on the board about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half, and I've heard quite a number of these cases. And I have to say that the things that you have done and accomplished over uh, your first four years uh, really is, is commendable. Um, you've been involved in a lot of worthwhile things. You, uh, work very hard to um, improve yourself, if you will. And with those things taken into consideration before those communications, so those things have been given weight, which is why you're eligible for parole at this point. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to maybe have you highlight for us. Um, you had 29 disciplinary violence, which over a 44 year period of incarceration is not extraordinarily high, I mean, although we had people at very few. One, I think we had one, we only had one. Uh, but, but otherwise, it was a very exemplary record. Uh, your last write-up, I believe, was in 2015, about seven years ago. Do you recall what that was about? Yes, ma'am. They said I messed up the count on the main prison compound. We you were... What? I messed up the count. On oh, the count? The count, yes. The count is important here. And they count in the mornings and... It was a stormy day, and I all of the lead mentors were down in the HVAC building, and they had a recount. And the lieutenant that was in charge of making the recount never come down and made a recount. It was a stormy day, and that's the reason I didn't get locked up. But I had to take the I had to take the charge. But. Uh -huh. Well, let's go over uh, again, just briefly, some of the things that you have accomplished. Uh, you completed seminary. Yes, ma'am. When did you enroll in the seminary? In August of 2003. I completed in May of 2007. And what led you to enroll in seminary? Ms. Jackson, I've got a good woman behind me. I've got a good wife, Christian wife behind me. She's the one that led me to the Lord in 1996 at Camp J in the dining room on the floor. She was there on her knees with me. She's the reason I'm here today. She has walked beside me and encouraged me and, and, and Ms. And Ms. Jackson, I've had a big heart change. I've had a big heart change. I'm not the man that they have said all week on the television that I am. 
from 1979. And we certainly recognize that people have capacity to change, why the legislature would never have uh, put this process into law because they do recognize that people have the capacity change. But what I want to know is how did attending seminary change you? Ms. Jackson, I was honest with you last December. And I'm going to be honest with you right now. These last seven years I have served as the pastor of the Point Lookout Committee. I have stood over the last 75 funerals in this, in this prison. I have served as an inmate minister since 2003. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian since 1996. I've been a husband since 2001. I've been a class A trustee since 1992. My conduct record is very good. There are no fights and there are no drugs in my conduct record. That's unheard of for a man that's been here as long as I have. I am a certified vocational tutor for the Department of Corrections, and I'm a certified vocational mentor for the Department of Corrections. I'm a lead mentor with the reentry program, and I've been in reentry longer than everyone. Everyone. I helped start this program 12 years ago. And God has been by my side and walked with me through everything that I have taken on. I'm thankful for the Department of Corrections and for the programming that's been available to me here at Angola. I'm not a threat. I'm not a threat to my victims. I'm not a threat to anyone in East Baton Rouge Parish. I don't want to take my, I only want to take my wife and leave the state immediately if that's possible. And again, um, Mr. Chenevere, I'm aware of all of the, the good things you've done. I, and I don't mean to minimize that in any way. I, they call me the devil on the TV this week, Miss Jackson. I'm not the devil. I am the face of rehabilitation at Angola, and I'm the face of rehabilitation within the Department of Corrections. I'm not the first violent offender that is seeking his release from this institution. And I proudly want to carry this. I will not disappoint. I proudly walk behind men who have left, violent offenders who have left here, like Wilbur Rito and Eugene Channing Hill and Carrie Myers and Andrew Hunley and Sidney DeLoach and Jimmy Robinson, who have all left through this board before me. And that men that knew God and men that have turned their lives around. Ma'am. And again, all of that is part of our record. And, and I, I know your sincerity uh, again you know there is always a capacity to change i understand and uh, very few of us are the same person today that we were when we were 20 or 21. That's so there's that recognition that people before they change but also, there's also the other side. Yes, ma'am. I understand. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, I'll tell you, this happened in 1979. Yes, ma'am. I had uh, graduated from law school in 1978. And so I was here when the crime occurred, and I, you know, have been familiar with the uh, case uh, over the course of years. I sometimes drive by Chateau de Jean and it's 
I'm refreshing my memory. You said you said that last year, I remember. Right, right. But you know, one of the things that struck me back in 79 was the story that you were telling about a Mexican person uh, having committed the crime and then forcing me to hang over, hiding in the closet and, and hanging over the wall. Uh, and you maintain that story for two years. Uh, can you tell us why? Ms. Jackson, I lied to my father and I lied to my lawyer and I lied to O.C. Brown and I lied in front of the grand jury. I was scared and I was making up a story as I went and when I realized that my story wasn't going to hold up when I got indicted, the evidence from the crime lab was disproving my story. And I had to straighten up and tell my lawyer, Mr. D'Amico and Mr. Dam, look, I did it. A lot about it. And that, that's why I got indicted. That's why I got indicted because none, none of my lies made made any sense. And well, you got indicted because you committed the crime, and the evidence is sufficient to show that you committed the crime. Yes, ma'am. Right. What I'm trying to get at, you, you, your dad was in law enforcement. I, you know, I guess you put on you know, your law enforcement hat, and you put on your parent hat. I have a hard time believing your dad bought into that story, but as a parent, he might have wanted to believe what he wanted to believe. But you're maintaining that story for so long. Uh, how do you think that impacted the family of the victims in the case? I'm sure it was very traumatic. I'm sure it was very traumatic. My, my case was moved from East Baton Rouge Parish to the 4th Judicial District to Washtenaw Parish for a change of venue. And my upcoming trial was put off for months, six or seven months, which of course, it never happened as I pled guilty. I pled guilty in Monroe and I know, Ms. Jackson. Can you understand? I made a, how, I, I it, it was it was difficult. It was difficult. I know it was difficult for the victim's family. I made a serious mistake. I did. It was not a mistake. It was a deliberate act. I made a bad call. I made a. I had a. I did a bad thing. That's what it was. I did a bad thing. I did a bad thing. And can you uh, see, can you see how sticking by that story for so long might cause the victims to question your sincerity? At that time, yes, ma'am. At that time, yes, ma'am. And I realized that. I appeared in front of the pardon board in 1992, 30 years ago, after 13 years of incarceration. And I had huge opposition then. And then I appeared in, in front of the pardon board in 1995, and I had the same opposition. And I understand that. I understand the opposition. And then I didn't appear again until 2021, and I have this. I have the same opposition. I know they're here today. I know they're here today. Again, I would like to simply say that I am sorry. I am sorry. I did not want to say anything negative about Michael Brown or Evan McIntyre, and I haven't. I haven't. We were friends. 
And anyone that was there knows that. It was a bad incident. It was a bad incident. And to my victims, I would simply like to say, I am so very, very sorry. But the man that, that took your loved one's life is not the man that is sitting here in front of you. It does not take a life sentence to teach some men a lesson, Ms. Jackson. You know that. You know that. And I'm simply throwing myself at this board's feet for mercy. And, and, and I understand that, Mr. Brown, and whether the victim's family ever forgive you is within their control. That's correct. Not, That's correct. It, you really don't have a right to forgive me. It's something they have to choose. I understand that. I understand that. You understand that. Uh, you have more letters of support than I could count. Um, yes, ma'am. One letter in the packet came from Mr. Brown. Um, yes, ma'am. Tell us how you know Mr. Brown's son. I'm very honored to tell you that, Ms. Jackson. When I was in the seminary, about my third year, I got a letter from Mickey Brown, Michael's son. He was incarcerated in Missouri. I never knew him. And he wrote me and he told me, he said, Mr. Dave, I'm locked up and I found Jesus and I got him in my heart and I forgive you for killing my daddy. And he was very inspirational in changing his mother, Ms. Vicki Hatton's mindset towards me. He was incarcerated on an ugly charge himself. And though I knew it was against the rules to communicate with one of my victims, this is my victim's son, and I could not let such an opportunity pass me by. So we wrote, and we wrote for several years, mostly about God, until he was released and he made parole and came home to Denham Springs. He was in touch with my wife numerous times. And Mickey Brown was going to speak at my pardon board hearing. Whenever it occurred, I was granted in 2019. My hearing didn't occur. My hearing didn't happen until 2021. Unfortunately, Mickey Brown passed at the age of 50 in 2020. But he was going to speak in my behalf. And, and as you will well recall, his mother spoke at my hearing and spoke in his behalf as well last December. When God opens the door for a man, everyone's going to know that it's God. And Mickey Brown helped open my door. Uh do you know someone by the name of E.F. Dennis? Yes, ma'am. How do you know E.F. Dennis? What do you know about E.F. Dennis? Those are the grandparents of Wayne Martin. I helped save inmate Wayne Martin's life here in 1999. What role did you play in doing that? Ms. Jackson, I've had a very dangerous job here at Angola. I've been the Highline man. I've done the electrical work for about 18 or 19 years here at Angola. And 
I was seriously electrocuted in 1999. I nearly died over on the West Yard. And later that year, Wayne Martin and I were working together, hanging Christmas ornaments at the front gate. And he was seriously electrocuted, screaming. And between myself and the, the maintenance man, Mr. Douglas Dooley, who was working with us at the time, we got him off the pole and down into the bucket. I picked Wayne up. I slapped him in the face a couple of times and I was scared of that and I was shaking him and I was telling him to breathe. He was my friend and I didn't want him to die. And I remember I put Wayne Martin in Warden Louis Calvert's hands like this up at the front gate and Warden David Bonnet was there with him. And he just told me, he got him brief. And Mr. Dennis and his wife wrote a short paragraph that is in my portfolio there. And it says, thank you for helping save our grandson's life. And as I said, you've got multiple letters, <clears throat> but I am curious about something, uh, Mr. Chenever. Although there are comments uh, from your wife, I haven't seen comments from your your family, your, your mom, your dad, your brothers, your siblings. Miss Jackson. My father is deceased. Did he pass away? Yes, ma'am. In 2006, in 2006, my family has been beside me and has supported me the entire time I have been here. My mother and my sisters and my brother and their spouses and all of my nieces are gathered at my mother's house right now, watching this. They've been together this weekend and they've been praying for us, for Sheila and I. And I have all, I have so much family support. My family's there. I realize there are no, I realize there are no letters of support from my family, but you know, I. I thought when I made my portfolio and when I presented it, that if I know the love for my family, I know that it's there. And I didn't ask anyone in my family because I could I could have stacked that portfolio with a whole lot more letters than it's in it. I all of my letters of support are from the mentees. I've helped send over 125 men home from out of my school alone from the reentry program. And the men are appreciative. I've, I've gotten mentees in the dorm with me that wrote letters of support that, not, that are not even in my class, Miss Jackson. And I just thought they would make a bigger impact than hearing from my family. I understand that. Um, so tell us, if you were successful today, What's your transition plan? Ms. Jackson, I have a huge support system. And Commissioner Burrow Kane told you last December that he has a job and a house for me in Mississippi. He has eight. Wait, stop, stop. Where, where is, what's the job and where's the house? It's at Parchment. The, penitent the big penitentiary in Mississippi, in northern Mississippi. And what was and your job? He wants me working with the electric school there. He wants me working. Oh. He has eight. He has eight ex-offenders from this institution working for him now. And he wants me on. He wants me there. I'm good with that. And where would you live? They have a living quarters there at Parchman, just like they do here at Angola on V-Line. They have a living quarters for the employees 
at the institution. And how long do you would you anticipate staying there? Ms. Jackson, my health, my health is good. Praise God. I figure I could work at least another 10 or 15 years, no problem. Ma'am? Parchman? Yes, ma'am. I have no problem with that. So your plan would be to reside there, work there? Um, Live there. That's correct. Right. So you would leave one institution to live on the grounds of another institution? I have no problem with that. And what about your wife? She's coming with me. We've discussed it. She's ready. Well, Mr. Shanger, I think that uh, I have covered everything that uh, I wanted to cover with you. I would at this time like to hear from uh, the warden or prison staff right now. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Warden Ambo. Um, just to let you know that um, Offender Shannon has been a model uh, offender here. He has a plethora of things that he has done since he's been here. Uh, he worked at work as our lead mentor and reentry, and he also is an inmate minister. Um, no disciplinary problem at all with Offender uh, Shannon and his tiger is low. Okay. Is anyone else in the room who would have something to add to that? I'm the only one in the room speaking on his behalf right now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Warden Ambo. Uh, Chairman Renato, that's all my Thank you. Um, so we'll hear from those who are here in support this morning. Uh, we have with us by Zoom, Nikki Hatton. She is Nikki Brown's mother. Ms. Hatton, can we hear from you? Yes. Go ahead, Nikki. This past week with all the media and everything, I, I, I don't think I, I'm shocked at all the hatred uh, for this. It, it happened 44 years ago. It, the hatred that you hold in your heart at and your pride in that man. Please direct your comments to the parole panel, not uh, to the guests, please. I used to have that kind of hatred in my heart and pride in that hatred, and it destroyed me. And revenge is not the way to go. And I have, I forgave David a long time ago, and I think it's time. I, I believe in him. I do not think David is a threat in any way. He is not Charles Manson. He is not Ted Bundy or Gacy. Uh, he's not a threat to any of us. This was a one time thing. And there was reasons behind it all. This was the seventies where they had a lot of drug mules coming in from Columbia. And there was port protocols. And if you did not follow the rules, you were a dead man walking. Michael messed up and put all the blame on David. So he became a dead man walking. He became furious. He did the situation. He handled the situation completely wrong. But the rage is just what it is. And I don't believe that Michael and Evelyn deserved what happened to them. But they also played a part in this whole scenario. I think it's time to let it go and move on. 
it is time to move on. Thank you, Ms. Hatton. We appreciate your remarks this morning. Thank you for your participation. We'd like to hear from the Faro Project now, Mr. Myers. Yes, good morning. Uh, Kerry Myers with the Louisiana Parole Project. You know, as you know, many men and women who come before this board committed serious crimes. Uh, David's no exception. Uh, what's clearly evident, though, is that it, David is light years away from the person uh, he was 40 years ago. Uh, long gone is the immature, selfish taker. His record indicates uh, that he's a man who gives and has given back for decades as a teacher, a mentor, a counselor a husband and more, uh, you know, he's dedicated his life to finding redemption. And even when redemption couldn't find him, he was doing that. Uh, while David has accomplished a lot uh, through education and, and training and community service, uh, he's been incarcerated 40 plus years and there's a lot that he needs to learn. And Parole Project is prepared to help David through that transition. Um, social norms, finance, uh, technology there's a there's just a, a 41 years is a plus is a very long time to be incarcerated and the world is significantly different from the one he left and we're here to support him through that change uh so he is ready to take that next step uh as he goes to mississippi so we we're uh, we want to uh, emphasize to the board that we are prepared to help david uh, we believe uh, david is is no threat to public safety uh, as you can see, his sincerity is, is clear, and we would just ask this board today uh, to grant David uh, his release under any conditions this board deems appropriate. Thank you. So at this time, we'll hear from the opposition uh, and those who are here with us in Baton Rouge. First, we'd like to hear from Ms. Kathy Wallace. Thank you. You can you can you can stay at your seat if you would just stand up though and speak loudly so we can hear. This is Mr. Mr. Boudreaux. Uh, I'm here in front of the board to ask that this man not be turned loose. He made a deal. With O.C. Brown, that he was staying in Angola for the rest of his life without benefit for Now the board seems that they want to change that deal that he made. Bottom line is, he admitted to killing my sister, Michael Brown. They didn't even have a chance to fight for their lives. He went in there like a thief in the night, stabbed Michael Brown in the chest. And then went to slicing on my city. Okay, the other part of it is that he knew what he had done. He wrapped the bodies in the tent every time I see a tent or a car, I break down my little sister. He bottled them up along with the back and threw it in the chateau to the own part. The only reason the police department found out that he did this in Randy's apartment was because the bodies went to stink. And the residents of Chateau John Park said something to their manager. They investigated and they thought it was something that they could get rid of, and they found two bodies. So the police department was called. Okay, uh, the investigation started. Uh, I don't care what he says or how he looks at it, I don't care who says it's hate or whatever. He made the deal. He was allowed to live. My sister, Michael Brown, didn't have a chance. He's allowed to have a wife and have a life. My sister, Michael Brown, didn't have a chance. Uh, the way I see it is, he made his deal. And yes, he's a good boy and all that now. But the bottom line is, he made his decision when he went in and killed those people. As far as I'm concerned, this board doing the injustice to the victims and the state of Louisiana. The simple reason is we spent money as taxpayers to investigate this crime. Moses Brown did his job. And the only reason he got the deal that he got is because my parents felt sorry for his parents 
along the ground. And they had agreed to let him have a second degree murder. But he got what he wanted. And it shouldn't change. Why should I have to give up my life to make sure that he sticks to his people? That's all I've got to say. Thank you, Mr. Peter. You want to give up our second? Yes, God. This is Evelyn and Michael. He was with the family. He was the only child with a stepfather. Only child. They had a hard time accepting this. Well, they didn't ever accept it. But when they agreed for Michael Brown to plead guilty to murder two, they were told. By O.C. Brown and the district attorney over there in the room, uh, that if they agreed to it, he would never be in that that out of jail. Never. They made sure they asked him that question. He said, "No man has spent the rest of his life in jail." So they agreed to that, and he fled down to murder two. They didn't tell my parents that this could happen. They could come up with parole. They didn't let them know that. They just told them he could be there for the rest of his life. So now that you let him out, that's that's not what they wanted. Not what they could be to. It's just pretty bad that we didn't have to go with that, go through all this. We've been here before, you know, same old story. Mr. Brown made his decision, you know, to murder my sister. And Mr. David King Skinner made the decision to murder my sister and Michael Brown. They said my sister had defense wounds up on her arms. That she was trying to defend herself. You know, probably when he was slapped him and stabbed her. The coroner said that she had fistfuls of hair in her fist. It was her hair. He said that when a person is in that much pain, that it's not unusual for them to pull out of their hair. He pulled it out by the roots. She didn't even weigh 100 pounds and he slashed it 13 times. So imagine 13 times, 13 stab in a, in a, a lady that doesn't even weigh 100 pounds. I disagree with you all that, Nico. I'm afraid you've already made the decision that you're going to do it to let go. And I hate that. I hate the thought of it being out in the public. I do request that he not have any contact with us at all. He wrote a letter one time to my sister saying that he got to meet with her, talk to her. He didn't even answer. My parents told my sister one time that they hoped what they say in the Bible is true. Kathy asked mother, what do you mean by that? She said, because the Bible says that one day when we get to heaven, we can see everyone and the end. So that's what she hoped it was true. They passed away all the time, all the years thinking that, you know, their children and their would stay in prison for the rest of their life. And now all of a sudden, he gets out. My sister didn't get out. She didn't need to live. She had a little baby. Baby grew up without a mom. I don't know what else to say. Miss Guy, thank you so much for your testimony.
testimony this morning. Yeah, you know, we have by phone, I believe, Kathy Wallace. And it's supposed to be by video. Yeah. I'm not sure that I see you, but we'd, we'd like yeah, to hear. I think I just started. There you go. Yes, we will. Oh, okay. All right. First of all, Elton <coughs> McIntyre was my little sister. I'm stunned by the inconsistencies in Mr. Chenevere's testimony. He clearly stated in both December and now that he left the house. He left the house for a couple of hours and came back, presumably with a weapon. And he proceeded to stab these two people while they lay sleeping. That's not second degree murder. That's not a spur of the moment deal. That is clearly premeditated murder. He left the house. He had time to think about it. And the other thing that he said was that he never did hard drugs. But yet he said back in December that he killed them because he was high on drugs. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never heard of marijuana or liquor, or alcohol, causing that much rage. And this was a rage killing. Any way you look at it, it was pure rage. Pick up just a stick, not even a knife, but pick up a stick and try to stab, try to do this over 30 times. That's hard to do. And it's got to be harder to do when you're staring at the person you're doing it to, when you're going through flesh and bone. When asked in December why he killed my sister, he said, well, and he said that today. She woke up. I had to. That's callousness. You've talked here and listened to him about what an exemplary prisoner he has been. But he clearly admitted today that he was in contact with his victims over several years. That's clearly a violation. He tried to contact me. That never should have happened. Is that in his report of him being an exemplary prisoner? You've heard in the past, I believe in December, about and today about Mr. Brown's children and what the trials and tribulations they have had to go through. But I don't think you've ever heard about my sister's only child, my niece, Erica. And I'd like to tell you about her today. The reason I haven't before now is because I've wrestled with this for many years to tell her story. But I believe today it's crucial and I hope she will forgive me. Erica was a year old baby the day that her mother was stabbed. She just happened to be at my parents' house for a few days. If she had been there in that house, we have no doubt that he would have either killed her or abandoned her in that house with her dead, the dead body of her mother, just like he abandoned both of those bodies before he threw them in a dumpster and treated them as just any amount of trash. That little baby Erica happened to be where she needed to be at that time. And for that, we're always grateful for. Recently, a picture was published of, I believe, the first hearing in the 90s that we went to. And it shows myself, my mother, and my niece Erica sitting at the table. And I was getting ready to do testimony. My niece never should have been there. It certainly was not my idea for her to be there. She was totally traumatized and terrorized after that meeting. She heard what she did not need to hear. She told me that her biggest fear, and she had nightmares about this, her biggest fear was to one day be maybe at the mall or someplace like that and run into her mother's murder. 
the biggest fear. As we sit here today, we, her family, do not know if Erica is alive or dead. After what happened to her, after what happened to her mother, her life went to a very downward, very swift spiral. Just, no matter what uh, we tried to Alex, do. Wallace, I'm sorry, we, we need you to wrap it up for us, please, ma'am, if you can. It, it's a shame that a double murderer has more time than the victim's family. I'm not even able to get in touch with my niece to tell her that her biggest fear is about to come true. Every child in this case that has gone without a father, without a mother, because Mr. Shiver had to fight for their own sanity, their own place in the world. Some have succeeded, most have not. He didn't just destroy the lives of two people. He destroyed many families. That large rock that he threw into that small pond on that day, we still feel the ripples. There's no vengeance in my heart. There's no hate in my heart. I'm here asking you for justice. The justice that was promised to us so many years ago. You cannot promise me that this unspeakable rage has left this man. You cannot promise me that I am safe, that the rest of my family is safe. You may be able to give me a paper saying that he can't leave the state or he can't contact us, but he's already done that. I'm just asking you for justice. I'm asking you to listen to us, to listen to us. Ma'am, yes, ma'am, Ms. Wallace, thank you. We are listening. We appreciate your testimony this morning. We have to move on and allow Mr. Brown's family to also speak. Um, so we have Alicia. Would you like to go first? Judy. Judy Poche. Judith Poche, my Alicia Green. Michael was my husband. He was my husband. We were separated. Very sad situation. But in my heart, I had hope that we would get back together and raise my daughter together. I know what David Chenevere did. He brutally stabbed Michael. Not once, not twice, not three times. Count up to 26 or over. That is a brutal, brutal murder. And then he stabbed Evelyn, a 20 year old. Both of us had babies. What was David Shinnever? Did he even care or think about its consequences? The ripples, like she said, of our lives, the victim's life? This doesn't go away out of the victim's mind. And at that time, I was blessed because without her, I could tell people. I had an angel from God, which he spoke to me that this will be the greatest thing I ever did. To write me, I was able to get on with my life. Why? Because David Chenevere pled guilty, was convicted of two brutal, brutal murders for life in prison without parole. That is a victim's safety and sanity to move on with life and know that we can go on with life. But at my age now, 69 years old, and I'm having to get up here and try to defend or think that this justice is right, I am thankful that David has rehabilitated his life. But he never 
gave Michael Brown or Evelyn McIntyre a, a time in their life to change and to have all, all these blessings, seminary to go to. He grew with their life. They did not get a chance to change or have a life. They did not get a chance to love on their children, to care for their children. That is what's wrong about this. That's what's wrong. I could not at the last hearing because when this 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 tragedy, when I moved on in life, you you learn to put these things in a box up here, and you know that's in your life, all your life as a victim, and it comes out sometimes, and you share with people, and you can share how you've moved on. But the pain and hurt of something so brutal, it doesn't go away, but you didn't know you put it up. This and these parole hearings, we're victims, and it's all brought out here. We're having to deal with all these emotions and saying, this man can go free, but he didn't give you people a chance to have a free life. Like I said, I'm thankful that he is a Christian. I'm a golden Christian. I'm thankful that he's a Christian. I'm thankful that he, he's changed his life. But Michael never got to come back and be my wife. But he's got a chance of having a wife. Having a wife. Michael and Evelyn don't have that. And for him to come out, he puts us back in prison of his fear. Of this tragedy that happened. I feel like that his legacy in life is to keep using the gifts of talents, his smartness with the electrical and all that in prison. Teach these young kids that's coming in prison that are doing things that had been as bad or as worse or is that worse and give them a life. There and keep teaching them. That's his legacy is prison and life in prison. That's his sentence. That's what we should be living by. And if there's reform in prison, we should have reform. But for a person that double murdered so brutally two people, I think that's an error in the system to think. That we can come and let somebody with back out of prison. His precious. legacy is his life and pain. My can you wrap legacy. it up for us, ma'am? Can you wrap it up so we can hear relation? Legacy, Michael's legacy is us living his life. I'll have a second. I believe that he is saying. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to say, David, I can't, I haven't gone here. Whatsoever. Growing up as a young child with a deceased parent, in a very tumultuous past. This is the day that you fear. This is the what if something happens. I've lost my ball and tortured all over me. From this disease. Me on the other hand, I couldn't. That's the other one. The last hearing I said, I wasn't decided. I'm opposed. I'm unopposed. I still don't know. I don't know if David knows this or not, but there's a lot of people that we know. Ever mutual. 
that I've checked in over the years. See how he's doing. That he really has changed. You can say that all you want, but his actions might speak. Yesterday, I went to church. And the first of all, what they said, I surrender. We did the same church. God put him on life, the head of prison ministry. Tell me about David. And there was a time he didn't believe that he had changed. He spoke to me on Friday. He said that he believed he had He's been through yesterday. We were saying this all. I realized I have to surrender to hear the decision. And yes, no, doubt everything to God. And that God would do your part. What is best for my family, Evelyn's family, even David's family. But that's it. But what is it? And we're not that people. And then Pastor Mike came up and he welcomed everyone. And he welcomed the men of Angola. And I had this twitch in my heart. So I really love Why? They need the most grace. And then if you're a Christian, we welcome other Christians black. But I can't tell you how hard that is to be a Christian and have to accept something you didn't want in life or ask for. <laughs> the only thing I can do now is pray. I pray that God speaks straight to your heart the best decision of the best for everybody. Because I can no longer carry that burden. And I realized that yesterday. I'm trying so hard to be unopposed or opposed, or I just couldn't do it anymore. The burden is way too strong and heavy. We appreciate your testimony this morning. Thanks for being here. I know it took a lot of courage. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'd like to hear from the DA's office. It's Barbara. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Renazza. Tracy Barbera for the East Baton Rouge Parish District Attorney's Office. Uh, Mr. Chenevere uh, received mercy from these victims' families back when they agreed to forego the pursuit of the death penalty for the life sentences. That maximum sentence, life without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. That's what this family has lived with since the early 80s when those sentences were imposed. By operation of law, those life sentences, which were to run concurrent, have been commuted to 99 years. Very difficult for these families to understand. It is by operation of law. Unfortunately, they are now in a situation where, assuming Mr. Chenevere continues on the path he has been on for the past 43 years, and I have every reason to believe he's going to continue to do that at, at Angola. So now the maximum sentence that the families can have at this point will be until his good time parole date, as Ms. Jackson said, March 27th of 2029. So what I am asking on behalf of them, on behalf of the East Baton Rouge Parish District Attorney's Office, is that these families get six and a half more years of accountability 
and that David Chenever remain incarcerated until his good time parole release. At that point, he will be just shy, I believe, of 71 years old, if I've calculated that correctly. He has told you this morning he is extremely healthy and he will have a lot of life left to live at that point, a heck of a lot less than his victims did. So that's what we are asking. We cannot change the past. We cannot change the fact that Michael and Evelyn are gone. I wish we could change the fact that these families have suffered so much. At the Every time these hearings come up, I can only imagine the emotion that they go through. And I think obviously you saw so much of it here today. So we ask that he remain incarcerated and less than 25 years for these two lives that he took in such a brutal manner, less than 25 years each, I think is certainly a benefit. He has received multiple benefits for his good, the good things that he has done in DOC, but I think it's time for that to stop and that his parole today be denied and he stay there until 2029. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be heard this morning. We appreciate your input as well. Um, Mr. Shinevere, before I turn it over to Mr. Dam, is there a brief statement you'd like to make to the panel? Yes, ma'am. To each of the victims today, from Evelyn's family and from Michael's family, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the pain and the hurt that I put in each one of your families. I made a bad decision. I do not want to say anything negative about Michael Brown or Evelyn McIntyre concerning the lifestyle that the three of us were living in at that time. None of us were walking with God. We were all in violation of the law. I did a bad thing. It would never happen again. This has been traumatic to myself as well, as well as my family. When I spoke at my father's funeral in 2006, I apologized to the Baton Rouge City Police Department because there were many, many officers there. And I was one of the Baton Rouge City Police family's children. I grew up with their children, and I was one of theirs, and it hurt the police department to lose one of their children. It hurts. It will. I'm not a threat. I'm not a threat. I realize that there have been several states. About 60 seconds, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna let Mr. Damp address the legality of my sentence because he knows that the death penalty was never on the table for me and that I pled guilty and I never went to trial. And I like that corrected as well. Again, I deeply apologize to the families and I thank this board for their consideration, each of you. God bless you. Thank you. Mr. Dance. Thank, thank you and good morning. Uh, in 1979, I was a very young lawyer. Uh, I think Judge Jackson uh, graduated a year after me, but I'd only been practicing a couple of years. And I worked uh, with a gentleman named Sam D'Amico, who at the time was one of the finest attorneys that I've ever been around. And he was friends of the family of the Chenevers, and we undertook uh, David's representation. Uh, I knew very little about criminal law coming out of school. 
And after uh, two years, I knew enough to uh, help on the case. By the time Dave pled guilty in 81, and I was four years out of school, I was a partner and I spent a lot of time with David. I could not understand. And I had the same questions. How could somebody uh, from a family of law enforcement, an Eagle Scout, all the things that he did, uh, how did this happen? It, it was it was a horrible event. Uh, there is there's nothing David can say or I can say or anybody can say that this was justified or that there's a good reason or anything. It happened. It was a terrible, terrible tragedy. But that's really not why we're here today. We're here today because he's, his sentence has been reduced to 99 years, and now he's up uh, before y'all for immediate release. And so now you look at all the things that he did. And so what really got to me is a few years, over a year ago, I was meeting with Burl Kane on a different matter, and I would just, uh, just talking with him, and I asked him about David Shinover, whether or not he knew him, and, and just out of the blue, he said, let me tell you, David deserves a chance. He deserves to be out. And if he gets out, I want to hire him. Uh, he was at this point, he was a commissioner of uh, corrections for the state of Mississippi. And I was shocked. And I said, why? He said, well, let me tell you. And he gave me all of these reasons. So I volunteered my time to be at the pardon hearing and, and today. And I read the booklet. And the things that really got to me were the facts, you know, not the fact that he became a minister and the fact that he does all the funerals and the fact that he does the services at the hospitals, but it was the letters of supports from the inmates, the letters from the people that he helped transition out of Angola back into society. And there was letter after letter after letter from people who changed the trajectory of their lives to a much better life. And so now uh, he's been offered uh, a job to work at Parchment. He's been offered a place to live. His wife has agreed certainly to move there with him. And there he can be a mentor again. He can help uh, with the inmates and he can be a benefit to a lot of people over the years. So that's the question before you. Number one, is he rehabilitated? I think everybody agrees to that. And number two, uh, if he's if you so release him, I believe he'll be a benefit to society uh, into the future. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. At this time, uh, I would uh, make a motion for an executive session to discuss confidential matters related to this case. We have a motion and a second for executive session. Could you do the roll call, please? Ms. Jackson? Yeah. Ms. Manalco? Yes. Yes. All right, we'll be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. Thank you about that. What do you think? Do you think they're going to approve? I got to tell you that after this hearing, I, I, I don't feel, I feel like absolute, I just feel no. Well, I, I think like Tracy Balboa, DA made a clear point. Um, it's just, he now has a parole date of a good time date of 2029. And he took two lives. Yeah, he's been locked up for 42 years but that's less than 25 years per life. And to re-harm the victims, to let him out eight, nine years early, how is that, how is that a fair trade-off? You know, another thing that really upset me 
is when Miss Renatza cut Kathleen off, who was given one of the finer statements that we have seen. It's a shame that a double murderer has more time to speak than her family. At least Miss Renatza cut him off at the end of his speech, said one more minute. But we've been here a long time, so I'm gonna fast forward because the wait is almost 10 minutes, which I think is a record for executive sessions. And I do wonder what they were discussing. Let's go. We are back in regular session. We are prepared to vote, and Ms. Jackson will be voting first. Before I vote, uh, let me just say the victim's family. I heard you. And sweet Alicia, I want you to know this is not on your shoulder. Okay, take it off. You know, we gave it to God, and that's where it needs to be. I just wanted to say that to you. Um, that being said, uh, let me just say, when we take a break, it's almost like a jury deliberating because this is a hard case. This is an extremely hard case. And sometimes it helps to talk to each other and to get each other's viewpoints. So I just didn't want anybody to think that you were hiding anything from you. Think of it in terms of a jury deliberating and discussing the case uh, to get each other's views. And so that's what we did uh, on our, on our um, executive session. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who participated. Your input in this case has given us um, information to use um, to what the very difficult to uh, This was a terrible crime, Mr. Shinnegar. There's no getting around that whatsoever. This was a terrible crime that had lasting consequences in the lives of many people. And so as I looked at the case, you know, I have to weigh, I have to balance. You know, what's what's right, what's fair, what is justice work. Uh, you have done some really wonderful things. You have you have accomplished quite a bit uh, in your in your 42 years of incarceration. You have. And I and I commend you for that. And back in December when this board or the parole board granted you a commutation. That was a recognition that you had done enough good in your life to have the opportunity for parole and to not spend the rest of your life in torture. With that being said, there's also the balance on the other side. And Take it from me, four years old is still young. And I can say that because I'm older than that. And so you're still a young man and you have a date in 2029 that you will be released regardless. You will get out, you will spend no more than that time in jail. And when I look at the, just the facts of the case, the seriousness of the crime, uh, and uh, the very strong opposition across the board from law enforcement, the judge, district attorney's office, and most especially the victim's family in this case, uh, my vote today would be to deny an early release because you already have a release and you're going to be released. But today, uh, my vote would be to deny uh, an earlier release than you get time. But I'm just one vote. 
And so um, we go up to you, Mr. Shenley. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Why? But Mr. Sir, I have uh, read the material that was presented. I was not on the point here. So all your information was new to me. Uh, and I want to commend you on the work that's done, that you have done in the prison before you even knew such a day was coming. You were, you were already doing some good. And I really want to speak to the, the families that were impacted by your act. I appreciate your courage uh, to participate in the process today. It's, it's really very, very valuable. I, uh, I was in a conference this weekend, and uh, you know, criminal justice professionals from all over, all over. And one of the things that was said in one of the workshops is that if individuals, they do harm, they get healed, and then they heal. And I see that in you. You've done harm. You did the healing work yourself, for yourself, and now you've been helped. And you've been helping long before you knew the law was going to change, long before all of that. Uh, so my vote today is to grant uh, the uh, release with the following special conditions. That you are to never return to Louisiana unless you have permission from probation. Uh, it has to be very extenuating circumstances. And that you are that you are released to an approved ICOX to either Mississippi or Texas. You have a residence plan, uh, the transition specialist, you know, be with most suitable for you. Yes, ma'am. I'd like for you to continue to do the work on the outside and help 20 hours of the community service. Uh, you know, individuals who need electrical work in their homes, and you know, you can be creative in a way to give back to the community at least 20 hours a month. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and I would like to see you enroll in general counseling. And in the end counseling, concentrate on grief and on marital relationship. It's going to be new. It's going to be new. And I know you're a minister and your wife, but uh, stay in counseling for a period of time that the professional say is enough time. But that is that is my vote. Again, I'm only one vote. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Well, Mr. Shinnevere, this is been hard for everybody. Is participating today. I want to echo my colleagues and you know, thanks to everyone who is here today and joined us by Zoom. I know it was a very difficult day for most everybody. Uh, I, I want to extend my apologies again for the victims of both families for having to go through this again. You know, it takes a lot of courage and you experience a lot of trauma as a result of being subjected to this again. Um, you know, I, I sat on the, at the a pardon hearing. I voted favorably for you then. My vote at that time was based on your institutional record, which we talked about today. Um, I also noted the demonstrated growth, uh, which you've shown through your service to others and your service to the facility. Um, the program completed. At that time, we had some very positive remarks from staff. Uh, in, in the risk instrument that we use shows a very low risk. Uh, I do not believe you're a risk of public safety. Um, so I'm going to vote for favorably at the end of the day. My vote for that is Mr. Grant. I would just modify the special conditions that you never return to Louisiana or Texas um, without permission from the parole officer. You Thank have no contact with any of the victim's family or extended family. We want you to work on your interstate agreement with the state of Mississippi. Sure. You'll not be released until that is approved because we want you to go straight to Mississippi. Fine. Thank you, ma'am. 20 hours of community service that Ms. Wise spoke to you about in the counseling as well. So you, you've received two favorable votes. So today you're Parole has been granted with us. He's a mountain chairman. Uh, Mr. Myers, there's some support you guys can still give him in whatever state he is in. Could y'all do that with Louisiana Parole Project? Yes, ma'am. There's some, we, some of it can be done remotely uh, through uh, video conferencing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Well, we would uh, like for, for you guys to do that, provide that support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
Wow. So I, I would, well, Miss Jackson said, no, I thought maybe, maybe he was going to be denied or maybe he would need a unanimous vote, but he got approved. But Miss Renata added the condition, which I think is really important. He has to go to Mississippi. Now, certain things that I thought were off by the end of this hearing was it looked like he was about to break down crying. And then as soon as the Mississippi thing came up, it was like he snapped out of it. And I don't, you know, I mean, they do say in prison, you, you got to learn how to hold your emotions. And maybe he grabbed control of it. But I, I also through the hearing, I saw him shaking his head and kind of even being aggressive, I thought, when the, the victims were talking. And maybe you can say it was more that he was internalizing shame. But to me, it looked like but my animosity is really held for now, I know that she was a victim in this as well because she was related to, to one of the deceased. Uh, um, and she spoke in the last hearing. But what she said, I thought, was totally unacceptable. Terrible, really. It was Vicky. She came up and she said, she talks about the media and, and they're making him out to be the devil. And, and she said, She said that all that hatred, all that hatred that you hold in your heart, and Mr. Ronson said, you have to, you can't talk, to, don't talk to us. And she, all the hatred that you hold in your heart, she says to them. And then I, I have, I, I, I knew that hatred, but I let it go. I forgave him. And then she goes on to put the victims through the mud, through the dirt. And she says, this was the 70s, and the Columbia Meals were there. And David, he had, uh, um uh the 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 victim um had 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 told them that david uh i'm sorry and she said that david had that michael the victim had told their dealers that it was david's fault that's what she said. And because of that, because of that, he felt that he had was pressured. He felt that he was a dead man walking to court her. And that's why he did it. And first of all, they said they were dealing. You know, this wasn't they weren't dealing powder. This was like. But besides for all of that, and even you, you're going to drag him through through the mud. I, I don't understand that part, and, and 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 that doesn't even make sense. Doesn't even make any sense. Like Kathleen said, he came back, and also something that I thought didn't make sense is that he said that they were all messed up. They're all you know hopped up. But not just on 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 the devil's lettuce and on alcohol. It was on black mollies. But I find that that his story doesn't make so much sense because he came back. He went out for two hours after having a shotgun put to his. He didn't know what to do. He he was scared. He was scared. He went to the bar. He came back. He came back, and they were sleeping. And. I find it hard to believe that after just two hours, after being hopped up on Black Molly, that they were asleep. And it's, you know, again, just the way that he described it. He said multiple times, uh, we, we weren't lot of buying citizens we, we weren't god faring but i don't blame them that's talking out of both sides of your of your mouth and he also said i don't remember her even wake like it was like what he was saying made no sense he he, he was saying I, I didn't think about her waking up. I didn't think about it. But it's like, as they had said, you came back into the house with one intention. You went into the bed. You didn't think she was going to wake up? That doesn't, it just doesn't, to still say it 42 years later, to say that, that's not a, okay. No, you went in there to off them. And 
how that was going to how uh, what does what does the reference even mean that he was a dead man walking? So you go in and you and you stab them thirty times. And I do believe the statement about the one year old child, which now they can't find her niece, and all these generational pain and trauma that's caused by really his monstrous acts. And to think that he was, you know, he, how much he had accomplished getting through college, two years of college by the age of like 18. And he's the whole world was his oyster. And to do this crime there, I believe there's something very wrong with him. Uh, but whether he will commit another crime again, he hasn't since he's been out. I feel like there's a lot of things that I want to say here. The article, thank you, Richard, again, when he was released, because this was a big story. Policeman's son convicted 1979 double homicide to go free, but must leave Louisiana. I'll put the link in the description. People leave for a day concerned family members and members of the community rally in solidarity with inmate currently participating in hunger strikes at David Wade Correctional. The hunger strike? I'm confused. Okay. After 42 years behind bars, Baton Rouge man is sentenced to life without parole for killing his roommate and another friend will go free. Louisiana Board of Pardons and Parole voted 2-1, to one, leaving David... Uh, who has agreed to spend the rest of his life in prison when he pleaded guilty. Also that, on his final statement, how he needed to get the last word about not not ever having the, the death penalty on the table. Notice that? I didn't like the way that ended. I felt like he, he had a temper. In 1981, to stabbing Michael Brown and Evelyn inside of Brown's home north uh, Stevendale Road, the board's decision came after nearly 90-minute hearing, which his family members... Victim spoke almost unanimously against his release. He covered his face and broke down in sobs as the board Cheryl Renata gave the final vote, breaking um, a tie between Pearl Wise votes in favor and his release and Bonnie Jackson's votes opposing. The victim's family watched expressionless as Renata read the restrictions of Shemport's parole, which included the stipulation that the 64-year-old leave Louisiana and not return without express permission from a parole officer. You've done harm, you've killed yourself, and now you're healing others, Wise told, told him, uh, who appeared at the meeting via Zoom feed in the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola. He was 21 when he stabbed Brown um, in the counter to death uh, in what investigators believe was a fit of rage after missing drug money one late September night in 1979. Brown was 26 and she was just 18 with the little baby. You think God was not there. After several days on the run, um, the son of Baton Rouge police lieutenant surrendered to authorities. Prosecutors initially sought the ultimate penalty, but he struck a deal. So there he's, he's wrong. They initially did seek that penalty, but they struck a deal pleading guilty in 1981 to two counts of second degree in exchange for life without the possibility of parole. In December... They had the commutation hearing, which we saw. Um, at the time, Michael Brown's daughter, Alicia Vaughn, who was just a month old at the time of her father's death, said she was not opposed to his release. On Monday, she began to cry as she told the board she no longer wanted the burden of making a choice. Instead, she said her Christian faith led her to surrender the decision. I've watched my mom be tortured by this decision. Well, this is, this is nice because I, I couldn't hear her talking, so I'm glad they documented it. If you are wondering what she said, I've watched my mom be tortured by this decision. I can't do it anymore. The burden is too heavy, she said. How hard is it as a Christian to accept something in life that you didn't want and didn't ask for? Judy Posh, Vaughn's mother and Brown's wife, said the reason she was able to move on, so it was Vaughn's mother and Brown's wife said the reason she was able to move on after the killings was because prosecutors promised years ago that she would never walk outside of those walls you learn to put things in a box but the pain and hurt 
it doesn't go away, she said. Evelyn Cameron's family remained forcefully opposed to his release, attending every hearing since his sentence. Like Posh, uh, and John Guy said she felt down the system but promised her parents, now both deceased, that he would stay behind bars for life. They didn't tell my parents this would happen. Her brother, Richard uh, Dickey, described the news reports in the months following his sister's deaths that showed up the tarp-covered bodies as they were pulled from the Lane apartment complex dumpster. Every time I see a tent or tarp, I think of my sister, he said. We made a deal. He was allowed to live. My sister didn't get the chance. I'm not the devil, he said. I am the face of rehabilitation. He later apologized directly to the relatives of Brown, calling his actions a bad decision, right? <laughs> a bad decision. The fallout from which he had also caused irreparable harm to his own family. I'm sorry for the pain I've hurt. I've put each of your families in, he said. Lawyers did not reply for additional comments. Francis Abbott, executive director of the State Board of Pardon and Parole, explained that he will be able to leave Louisiana under an interstate compact that allows supervision release to be handled across state lines. Without a vocational job offer waiting for him in Mississippi, said he has, he and his wife, whom he married while incarcerated in 2001, planned to settle far away from Baton Rouge after his release. In addition to leaving Louisiana, he will be required to complete 20 hours of community service every month and will be prohibited from contacting the victims. As they left the building, Vaughn and Posh said they felt numb about the board's decision. Vaughn said that she was thankful she would no longer have to endure another hearing. I'm just glad it's over, she said. I am ready to move on. I wound up stabbing my best friend to death, and as well as his girlfriend. Um, the only reason she died, she got in the way. It's sad, but it's true. 